The average meeting in a business context takes four to five emails to even get the thing scheduled. They want to embed that scheduling inside their workflow. Calendly is a scheduling platform. We help individuals and enterprises automate scheduling. Every minute matters. I want to manage my time doing high value things. Wow, what just happened? That was so much easier than the back and forth. It's an aha moment. The number of people that sign up as a result of that experience. There aren't many companies that are growing as remarkably as Calendly. It's a viral loop that creates a flywheel that is just unbelievable. I love building teams. So awesome to be able to go find talent no matter where they are. The goal has to be to be additive and to be an accelerant. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to let you take it away. First, I'd love you to just start off with um, why the data matter. So can you just quickly tell us what results people can expect or some highlight from the presentation today that people can take away? I think the takeaway is, I, I, as I put slides together, I focused on the last, I don't know, the last 15 years of experience going from what was originally called uh, uh, application service providing all the way to PLG and everything in between and, and finding the common patterns because um, a lot has changed and a lot hasn't changed. And, I, and I'll try to touch on those. Love it. Let's hear what you got. All right, let's do it. So uh, by way of introduction for both Garrett and I, uh, I am the CMO of Calendly. For the last year, I've been the CRO and the CMO. So I got to experience both the sales side and the marketing side. In my background, I've uh, been fortunate to work with some great founders across WebEx and New Relic and Quip that got bought by Salesforce. And uh, Garrett has come along for, uh, on the journey with me and we've learned together on what to do and more important, perhaps what not to do when, when scaling an organization. So we will, uh, again, we'll share some stories. These are just meant to be jumping off points for conversation after going through the slides. So by all means, please have, have questions or thoughts. Uh, would love to hear them. Um, but I'll jump in, I'll walk through some content to, to, to share. As I mentioned, I want to I wanted to cover things like um, uh, PLG. Let's talk. Let's start there, right? As you're on your path to 100 million in in revenue as a, as a growing company uh, in in the SaaS or PLG world, there's a couple of, a bunch of words that you see pretty consistently, right? Um, there tends to be a free trial involved when it's B two B. You see end user focus rather than maybe tops down. You see freemium. Online buying, the ability to purchase without talking to a sales rep, that lends itself to an SMB business, right? At least to start in many, many cases. Low prices, it's adoptable, viral spread, all of these things are part of PLG attributes and sort of the 2021 heading into 2022 business. You know, what's interesting though, is those same attributes literally now 20 years ago, uh, were, were actually very similar and weren't called these things. And, and maybe freemium wasn't as understood, but if you go back literally back to 2020, or uh, excuse me, 25, 24, 23, we, we were starting to build these business models, starting to understand what it meant to deliver software um, as a service, which again is, is a given term now, but my point is that there's been a lot of similarities and we've just matured and the, the, and I'll speak to some of the differences as we go. Um, we started with, I remember I joined a company called intranets.com in 2002 and uh, SaaS wasn't a word yet. And so we called it an application service provider, um, which just meant we're delivering stuff over the cloud, which also wasn't called the cloud back then, but thanks to Benioff and and all, all those fine folks for, for giving us uh, the right language for, for doing this. So I'll pause there and I'll say, all of those delivery uh, uh, vehicles ultimately don't matter. The business model in a sense, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that you solve customer problems. And the companies that I've had the privilege to at least you know, uh, try to contribute to um, solve the problem better than any other companies. You know, at New Relic, uh, we were in the category of application performance mark and management. 
which meant you know, transaction traces and digging into the code of, of web software. But we did it better than anybody else for the masses of developers that needed that capability. At Calendly, we do, it be, we do calendaring or calendar scheduling and scheduling automation better than anybody else. And that's ultimately, business models matter. There, it, I, I'm such a nerd around this stuff, but at the end of the day, you wanna start with a product that actually solves a customer's problem and does it in a scalable way. And Aaron and I think this was Sunday or Saturday or uh, had written something that I thought was appropriate, which is just remember, users don't care about your underlying tech choices, only how well you solve the problem for them. Uh, very largely true uh, and is, is an underpinning of any of the business model stuff that sort of comes second uh, as, as you do this. Um, going back to the, you know, going back in time sort of uh, metaphor, a, a question that I'd ask, we don't have to do it via, although feel free to put it in chat or what have you is, you know, who is the OG PLG company? And again, I'm biased, but I believe that company is WebEx. Um, not when it was part of Cisco, but back in, again, 2002, 2003, 2004, I think we were pioneering, and I, I, I joined a, a little bit after that, so I can't take credit for it, but Ryan A. Zeus, who spoke uh, this morning on, on the Saster event, um, was busy building and figuring out what it meant to have a sales model that got mixed with a um, with a self-serve model and, and what it meant to have freemium users and, and free users and paid users and uh, per minute usage. So they had a usage-based pricing as well. Like all of these things, a lot of that was founded early on in, in, in the WebEx days. And, and as you'll notice in the PLG narratives, it's coming back around where people are like, hey, we should do usage-based pricing. It's like, well, you know, per minute pricing back then was, was, was also a thing. And so it's just interesting. My, my point isn't to say that nothing's new. Uh, it is to say that like the foundations of where we're at, we're standing on tall shoulders and um, uh, there's a lot to learn from the past. And so I'll, I'll do that. So, but digging in, like it, sometimes home pages on websites are the best way to see what actually uh, how the business is run, as you'll notice in the top right, I think Garrett and I put the free trial button above the view demo, above the buy WebEx, you know, it, 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 the, these ideas, even then the free trial was a relatively new model and, and people weren't sure whether it was lasting and all that. And it turned out to be pretty darn um, powerful. But those attributes that I mentioned back on PLG also are applicable to, to a company like, like WebEx. Um, and I'll note from a segmentation perspective, which is the middle of that page there, um, that is also uh, uh, something that companies are still dealing with and, still, and it's a very natural part of, uh, of the business where um, WebEx largely started in the middle there with small and medium businesses, uh, started to eke our way into enterprise, but also um, uh, thanks to go, to go to meeting, forced us into sort of the individual space. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, but as you look at PLG companies today, oft they start in SMB, they start to win a bigger deal or two. And then they also, are, and you know, depending on the company, Calendly happened to start with individuals and is moving uh, right to left or uh, on, on your screen. So uh, again, the, these models exist. Uh, we've, I've had the, pleasure and, and challenge of trying to figure out how, when do you go up market? And again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So let's get in. What's new uh, in 2021 into 2022 is scale. The, the, even the number of users globally using the internet um, back at the beginning, it, it was just a smaller universe and never mind the companies that were willing to give the cloud a try. And so like the numbers get really, really small when you, when you add in who, who's actually ready and willing to, to do this. And so scale is probably the number one thing um, that is bigger and, and interesting in, in today's world. Um, and those trend, that scale has to, uh, looking back, I'm gonna run through some lessons. Given the title of this, this presentation, I thought, it would, I thought it'd be useful to actually look at real use cases. And Garrett, this is when I'm gonna ping you. Uh, for ideas and, and conversation too. Um, universal to all these things to a company 
um, is this progression. And I, I'm, I'm sure Jason has talked about it on stage at, at Sasser, but like, I, I can't stress how, how predictable this is. And if you know that it's predictable, then you can actually address it as a go-to-market professional. Um, but it's always, you started, I, you started a startup and it's like, I'll never hire salespeople because my product sells itself. Never, ever, ever. And, and, you know, the, for some companies that's true, but it's literally less than 1% of the ones that, that really break through that hundred million dollar, um, uh, uh, revenue number year two it's like hey see i got a million in sales plg will take us to the moon right there's no reason i'd ever have a salesperson involved they don't add any value right that sort of narrative then a couple of years later it's like all right fine fine yes i get it some smb customers need a little bit of help to purchase but they're just going to be you know a year out of college and they're just going to help uh move, move the company along and then two years later um, and again, I swear I've seen this time and time again. It's like, all right, how quickly can I hire a massive enterprise sales team? Um, a, an anecdote at New Relic uh, back in that time period, with the, I joined in 2009, 2010, and, and uh, Lou Cern, the, the, the CEO, had a, had a blog post that was like, we'll never hire salespeople and we're or we certainly will never give them gold watches or, or like, a, you know, all the expenses that go to salespeople, we're going to invest in the product. And the blog post lived for a couple of years. And then sure enough, you know, as we across the 200 salesperson uh, threshold, we, we, we put that blog post further and further in the past. In fact, I don't know that you could find it today on their site because it was, it was so ironic and comical. So my point is again, that like, wow, uh, this this is once again a predictable thing that is if you're in a five ten million person uh, ARR company today, um, you can predict that and see around the corner that you're going to want to add these capabilities to your organization. It does not mean that the PLG model is flawed. Quite the contrary, it means that you now have product market fit and customers want to buy the way they want to buy, and a big chunk of them want to buy based on. Um, sales relationships and or understanding the company beyond just the um, product interface. Um, I touched on this for a second, but I, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit. In 2004, um, the, the early PLG days, uh, I thought it was interesting as I was reflecting that, that the, the biggest uh, threat at the time, we were a public company, I don't know, a billion or two valuation, couple hundred million in revenue. Meanwhile, GoToMeeting was, was the, the scrappy startup out of Santa Barbara and, and had a $49 or $50 a month product that you could buy as a single user. As innovative as WebEx was, we had, we were, you know, consciously forcing customers to talk to a sales rep, even with a free trial. And then we were saying, oh no, we're, you have to buy five seats. You can be a three person company, but you gotta buy five seats. That's how we, it's, it's how we sell WebEx and, and, and how we provide such a great service. Meanwhile, go to meetings coming in and say 50 bucks a month, no annual agreement, no sales rep, just go buy it online. That was a, an example of a disruption that we still have the versions of that today. But um, to me, that was a good example of like, Hey, we're gonna, you're gonna be out innovated and, and you're gonna constantly have to keep moving as you figure out <clears throat> how your business goes. At Calendly, we have scrappy <clears throat> startups that are on the fringe of us and we take them very seriously because we know that they are the next using this, this example. Go to meeting came up um, behind WebEx and we had to innovate quickly. Luckily we did, we came out with a competitive single seat product that you could buy online. That took off. I think it went from zero to twenty million dollars in the first eighteen months of business. It was it was it was a rocket ship, <clears throat> uh, which yielded more revenue than if we had stayed true to the only sell five seats. So, uh, I guess lessons for me is the scrappier PLG codes can can disrupt you, and um, and don't be afraid to learn from your competitors. Maybe is the other thing to to learn um, as long as you can move quickly and and execute. Garrett, I assume you remember those days when we were, we were uh, uh, we, the, the product that we launched was called Meet Me Now. And there was internal competition as well because we did, the company wasn't used to having this single C product that had a different name. And so, so we had like this constant back and forth. 
uh, internally about how do we handle this disruption that we were feeling in, in real time. Yeah, <clears throat> and I mean, the hardest part too is was how valuable was a single seat of a monthly user versus the five, you know, how much do that, so on the demand gen growth side, like how much can I pay for somebody to sign up for Meet Me Now versus Meeting Center, which had a minimum you have to pay. Meet Me Now could be anything from $49 to, you know, hundreds of dollars and so knowing that it, your metrics are going to change and that's okay uh, but just be on be on top of it and, and know that uh disruption's fun even internally <laughs> it makes everybody think and think on their toes that's right i think i think that's right and and following that thread the other thing we learned is that that 49 dollar product became essentially a paid trial so you could watch someone from coca-cola or some large company start using the Mimi Now product. And it, we got good at the data and understood when, when clearly that Coca-Cola person is gonna become a um, five person seat, then hundred person, and then, and then an enterprise deal. So those models are great, but you have to be open to that disruption. Um, the second one, I've been fast forwarding eight years, but, but why not? Um, and, and part of the reason eight years because I joined bad startups and had bad ideas in between the WebEx Cisco days and New Relic, but landed at, at uh, New Relic, as I mentioned, 2010. And, and this is the story of, uh, there's a couple different stories in, in, the, in this learning. First of all, I am a big believer and advocate and, and uh, loud voice that um, once you hit 100 million in ARR, if you're not prepared for it, you can almost guarantee that gravity is going to start to pull your growth rate down. Of course, not every company, and, and if, if I unmuted, everyone would have one or two examples or 10 examples of, of maybe collectively of, of when this isn't true, Dropbox, and, but, but it's far, they're, they're named on one or two hands, and it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a common thing. And, and I think the gravity happens in a bunch of ways. One is you reach a, the early adopting, you know, uh, low hanging fruit and, or whatever the cliches are for, for that early success. Two is competitors, I think, start to arise. And, and they, so they start to nibble at your, your dominance and your growth rate because we are all part of a venture capital community, which is like, oh, wait, I saw that thing grow from five to 10. I'm going to, you know, I need to invest one of those. And then that cycle continueth. And, um, and so we see that. And then I think third is you do end up transitioning the, the total addressable market, the TAM that a company uh, focuses on. We always use these big numbers, 4 billion, 5 billion, 20 billion. That's a hundred billion dollar market. If we can just get 1%, you know, those types of sound bites. The reality is um, the, the, the true TAM Without a sales team, I can't believe I'm the guy that's now arguing to build a sales team early in a startup. But the 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 true TAM is number of customers that are willing to put in a credit card and buy a business tool, or a, a, in Neural's case, it was a, a developer tool by myself for me as an individual. Right? That TAM, that the number of people that are willing to do that and willing to part with their own money, even if they can expense it later, is a much smaller TAM. And so if you're successful there. You, 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 you can almost guarantee that you have product market fit and then can go up into bigger organizations. Um, here, uh, with ID, for, for us, this was the biggest transition that the company probably had to make, similar to WebEx in, in that transformation, which is we actually not only had to change from developers to, to someone buying on behalf of the developers, but we had to change the buyer entirely. So we ended up having to win the IT group instead of the, the, the individual developer. That is a big shift for a company. I mentioned like the website is a great example. The homepage is a great example of the, these transitions. We had to go from talking about, you know, I think our tagline was the developer's best friend, right? And with a picture of a developer with headphones and, and you know, all, it's just, yes, some of it was cliche, but like we, we had that story and then we had to um, transition to, you know, the, the, the enterprise IT buyer does not wear headphones and, and a hoodie and, you know, slinging code all day long. Um, and so that was a big transition for us as a company, culturally, who we sold to. And then it was, of course, how quickly can we build a sales team? Because those IT organizations 
are expecting you to have a, a sales organization um, to meet their needs. Um, no, no, they're not just there to bridge the gap. The, the, these customers have a long list of security needs, um, integration challenges, and all, all those things. And so you hit that gravity at $100 million, like it just starts to pull you down in, in recurring revenue. And you have to see around that corner and start building the, the infrastructure to go, to go do that. So you want to see around the corner and, and start to invest. In this case, it's sales, but, but the see around the corner metaphor is very useful as you, as you scale up to and past $100 million. Garrett, not to put you on the spot, but anything to add on that as I think about our, our developer's best friend experience? I mean, uh, we were their best friend and they were our best friend. We, I mean, it, it was a huge shift. We had a predictable model that I could do almost anything to for three or four years of if I spend this amount of money, we'll get this amount of money. And, and it, no matter what I did, it didn't break. And then once we started realizing the majority of our customers are a thousand employees or more, you get you start to realize that at those places, processes and, and rules are in place and you have to start to see them coming. We ran into procurement a lot more. We started running into legal a lot more. Security was becoming more of a thing and then eventually it just completely stopped and it was all IT. Uh, we didn't have on the marketing side, candidly, uh, I'll own it. We didn't have the materials ready to go to them, right? We didn't know how to do anything really other than get somebody into the free trial, get them to put our, deploy our code, and then we could easily sell them. We had to learn that very, very quickly. Luckily we did because we had a great team, but see around when you start to see your average company size of your deal, of you know coming in your customers, as they creep up, those hindrances or, 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 or friction in your deals start to happen, right? Legal will start to play the biggest part or a, a procurement person who doesn't understand what code is because it's all a new thing and that's fine like that's not their job but we yep. we needed to as a marketing team and as a go-to-market team help sales have those conversations uh a lot quicker than we thought we would so pay attention to who's buying your software um you know and i, I i'm thinking back because you you mentioned like like we would spend to bring in more free trials um, it wasn't spend recklessly, but like we knew who we wanted to target, which communities and all that good stuff. But the, the, I remember board meetings leading up to 100 million, which, which I know these conversations are still happening. They don't have, happen in Calendly, interestingly, but like they happen almost everywhere else, which is like, how quickly can you spend? Money's cheap, right? So the valuations were high. They kept getting higher, but like you, you could you can invest capital. Um, to go and and the the phrase that the board meeting had, or the, you know the 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 VCs that were part of the board had were you know spend until you break the model like keep going uh, and and for us the model was a payback time period on the marketing investment of of one year so right so so it was spend a dollar get a dollar in ARR kind of mentality and and when I started we were probably spending a dollar to get ten dollars in revenue. And by the by the time we hit hundred million, we were spending that hundred ten dollars to get to, to, to 10 in, in in new ARR. That model didn't work after we like literally 101 million dollars as we were preparing for the IPO. It it didn't work the same way. And that's when we had to transition to the IT buyer. So you're absolutely right. And and my point in bringing that up is like this this slide is about transitioning to IT, but there was a fundamental go-to-market strategy shift that we also had to deal with and, and wrap our heads around. I'll never forget the conversation of like giving up money, marketing dollars, because we were very marketing heavy uh, go-to-market spend and giving it to the sales leader because she was busy hiring a, a, a enterprise sales team that didn't need the same level of marketing support. So fun to watch. Um, a couple of years later, uh, after the New Relic IPO, Garrett and I went over to a, a little company called Quip. Uh, we were, I don't know, I'll make up the number, but probably 25 people being incubated in a modest office, to say the least, um, uh, incubated underneath Benchmark Capital um, on a anyone that knows San Francisco, Sixth and Market, so a, a tough neighborhood, but, um, you know, Quip was, was, was on its path to greatness. We had less than a million dollars in ARR when we joined, and, but the optics of the company were so different than, than that 
ARR reality. And it's not to say this was like a strategic problem. We knew it. Um, but at the end of the day, we were claiming, and we had over 2 million mobile registered users that were using it for everything from shopping lists to business use cases and everything in between. But we weren't in the business of monetizing that, that interest and that demand. And candidly, when we went to try, the mental model that those customers had, in part because of the way we interacted with them at the beginning, was like, no, 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 this is a free service. It's, it's chill. I like it on my mobile device. Um, the, the, the lesson being that like those optics, that matter, how great to have 2 million uh, people download and use your app, but the, the optics were far different from the reality. And it was the next year and change prior to the Salesforce acquisition was moving us from being the end user centric story to a B2B like, hey, we actually solve problems for teams, right? And, and, and yes, we do all the things your document surface does with Google Docs or, or Microsoft or what have you, but, but um, our special sauce through research and talking to customers was the collaborative pieces, which means we weren't a single person product. We started focusing on collaboration and that's when the, the sales started to accelerate. And of course, Salesforce came in and, and bought us because they saw that acceleration and they saw a guy named Brett Taylor who um, was the founder and CEO of Quip and now the co-CEO of Salesforce. So, um, the, but the takeaway for me is like, be careful of the big numbers, track them, celebrate them. But as most of the people I think on this call are going to be go-to-market professionals or entrepreneurs, um, uh, starting companies or founders, you know, I, the, the cautionary tale is don't get too drunk on the, the number of mobile registered users and instead make sure that you have a business model that converts that to ARR. Um, and you know, from a cautionary tale perspective, it's because we'll, we'll have to deal with that at some point. Um, and, and at some point, perhaps it, the getting more VC capital will be a little bit harder to get. So that, those are the, you know, I will translate that or transition that nicely into the Salesforce thing. Um, we got bought by Salesforce. Uh, you know, it's, if you have the, the fortunate opportunity to join a company's greatest Salesforce, but also the pain of the transition, it always goes like this. We're gonna keep your brand separate. You're gonna run, you can sit in a different office. You're in, you know, we're not gonna influence your business model. You're doing great. The, the first year or nine months to a year kick in. And you know, uh, the, you, if, you're, if you have a different culture and a different DNA, if you're PLG, which is what, what um, Quip was, and you're in a company that is not a PLG company. Salesforce is an amazing company, but it ain't a, well, one thing it ain't is a, is a, um, a, a PLG or product-led growth company. Maybe it's a platform-led growth company if you squint, but really it's customers-led, founder-led, and it is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, sales-led for sure with, you know, I, I don't, I'm not privy to how many reps they have now, but, you know, Couple of years back, it was five, seven thousand people that that were selling Salesforce. I'm sure it's way more than double that now. So, um, the takeaway for me was, and, and so year two, it was why am I fighting, or why are we, why are Garrett and I trying to defend the PLG business model, the the self serve and the viral bottom up led growth model when, when. Sales reps are at, within Salesforce are are dying to sell Quip to the enterprise. We we had proven that that um, large customers want it. Amazon had a couple hundred thousand people using it every day. Like we had all of these signals, and yet you defend the PLG uh, storyline and and the business model. And and who knows? Maybe maybe Quip would be even more impactful in the world if we had committed to that. But I also think. Um, you know, it's a multi hundred, I assume it's a multi hundred million dollar contributor to Salesforce and, and a big chunk of, of Salesforce's transition to more than a, a CRM company. Garrett, any anecdotes as we, as you think about that transition, that one personally oh. for me, it was a challenge. So I can only imagine for you, it was too. This one was the, this was the biggest challenge. And I say it a lot like this one was the biggest hit to, to the ego. Um, it took us a long time to admit to ourselves that trying to, to get Quip to every single person out there, every single company and every single use case wasn't going, although we did it and we did it well and we did it better than others in some cases, we did a certain, th we did certain things really well 
for yep. the enterprises, for the bigger companies. And, and once we sort of checked that ego at the door and trust me, it took months um, and, a couple, and honestly, candidly, a couple of good deals to be like, oh, that was nice to see. Um, we checked it and then we really, we, we refocused. We had the harder conversations of like, we can do this and companies will still buy it. We didn't stop the PLG side of Quip. We just didn't market it. We didn't take it to market, which are two different things. And, and uh, it was a nice transition. And, and after that, salespeople were happy, engineers were happy, marketers were happy, executives were happy most importantly. And so have that conversation of like going to market and what your product does can be two different things and, and done well, happy customers in the enterprise will can lead to other you know, press and, yep. and whatnot that drives the the rest of your business so i think, yeah, that I think that's right and then and then internally every metric that we had to measure instead of cost per sign up or or um or even traffic conversion rates like a lot of that fell away in exchange for pipeline you know mm -hmm. pipeline became the the single single number we all cared about um how much pipeline can we give to to this overlay sales team within Quip? How much how much pipeline can we add to the to the bigger Salesforce engine? And and that is a cultural shift that you know you go through. And but the net the reason to focus on pipeline is because it's much closer to the action in terms of uh, of revenue production once once you're in flow. Um, so yeah, man, I I. Uh, the, those were that for me as well, like the, the, the cultural defensiveness of, yeah, but we are building this this way and I'm proud of the engine we built. Um, that was a hard one for, for, for me as well. Now, <clears throat> after taking a little bit of time off, at least personally, I then landed at um, Calendly and <clears throat> Garrett uh, w was, I think the first call or second call or so that I, 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 I made, I needed to build a sales team and a marketing organization. I'll give you a sense of, of Calendly in a nutshell though. Um, uh, we are 300 people growing at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, we raised a bunch of money in January of last year, but we're profitable, highly scaled. Um, I feel like we've found the perfect storm of goodness um, where we have virality. The use case is you, ubiquitous um, and we have very high ease of use. Um, and and I got here um, challenged with, you know, having both sales and marketing and, and I thought I'd be doing my marketing thing. Same deal, like the, it's, a, it's like a PLG juggernaut. We're not gonna focus on, on sales, right? And, and when I got here, I realized or saw immediately, and it's not, it's not that I'm clairvoyant or, or anything, it's, it was clear that there's such a big opportunity that the largest companies on the planet were, were saying to Calendly, we want to purchase and we want to roll you, Calendly out to every one of our users, um, but you got to, you got to, you got to go along with us on this journey. Now, that's not to say Calendly was incapable, but but we hadn't made it a priority because the PLG, the, the, the viral flywheel that was helping the company grow was so powerful that we didn't have the same urgency that a startup that, that was focusing on larger customers has to, has to focus on. So that, again, as I, as I walk through these things, I think this presentation ended up being a little bit more about cultural changes as, as you scale, but because that, that is largely what um, we're doing at Calendly. So today, you know, so looking out, uh, we, we basically had a very, very small sales team about a year and change ago. We now have a still relative to other peers, a small sales team, but it's five, six X what it was um, again a year ago. And the contribution from a revenue perspective is, is much larger than even that multiple, right? And so I think there's a bunch of stories in there um, it's seeing around the corner for sure, um, or see what the next horizon is for the company. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is fair or not. And so I'll say this cautiously, but the, the soundbite that I always use is the um, Evernote story. Um, I adore Evernote. I, I, at the time I was a, a, a rabid fan and evangelist, and yet, they hit that I, they hit that hundred million dollar revenue number and I, and they didn't quite have the second act ready or the next the next level ready and I think they suffered from that 
I don't know where they are in terms of, again, revenue or, or growth. I, I know that it's it's still a, a heck of a company, but but it the the story at the time versus, and they, they innovated freemium, they did all of these things. And yet, because they didn't have that second act, which as this presentation suggests, it's it's building a B two B product that that you know can be purchased centrally, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They missed the the next phase of life where uh, maybe it's seventy five million into hundred and, and beyond. And and I think that's a drag because it it, it really it was and is a remarkable company. Um, and I, for all I know, it could be a ten billion dollar revenue run rate company, but I, I don't think it is. I think it struggled to find the the, the next thing. Um, so at Calendly, uh, the the to give you again, I, I, the the business model is so unique and and um, remarkable uh, because that the 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 little equation of what makes PLG great of of product market fit plus Virality, man, that is something that if it, I don't think you can engineer for it. I don't. I don't know the Topar founder fully understood what he was, the 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 incredible value that that would create. But the, those two things together, combined again with with making it dead easy to use and really solving a customer pain point, has taken off. Um, and the transition for us as marketers and 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 Garrett can hopefully you'll attest to this is. The, the, instead of focusing on amazing content for that end user, we got to do that still. And our blog is alive and, and, and well, but we, we, we're building a lot of muscle in, in making sure that people know that we're so much more than just that scheduling link. Um, underneath that scheduling link is, is an enterprise platform and it has, has security features that, that rival you know, Salesforce in terms of, of being ready to handle enterprise customers. And then the use cases that we can provide both via API and um, with features that we're building underneath just the link are incredible. And, and so that is Tope seeing around the corner and saying, hey, I'm gonna invest a lot of product resource and making sure that we are we are enterprise ready, and man, has it paid off? We, we, it's it's been a it's been fun to watch and be part of the the, the transition. And you know, G Garrett's been here about a year too, and uh, same deal. The metrics for the first you know sub hundred million were X, and and then this next leg of the journey are Y, and they're very different. And shocker, pipeline becomes a much more used uh, word internally. Um, so I think, you know, again, similar story, but I, I think that, that, um, hopefully hits the, the nail on, on, on what we're saying. Garrett, anything to add as we, as we transition? Uh, <clears throat> not really just be okay with change. It's going to happen. And, and it's not, it's sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes it's, it's data and it's uncomfortable, but uncomfortable means you're trying something new. And so, uh, you know, have the harder conversations, even though. Yeah, just stick to your guns. I, totally. I I had thrown this slide and I won't, I think I covered all of this stuff. First of all, IT is not the enemy when you're a startup and 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 you know, IT saying no because you don't have this part of SOC 2 compliance or whatever it is, they're not the enemy ultimately. Um, count the right things we covered. Sales isn't the enemy. Uh, and and I, I would add too that product led doesn't mean you get to skip all the um capabilities uh, regarding go-to-market stuff. Uh, invest early, just like you would if you weren't product-led because all of those skills are needed. But let's chat. Um, I can't see the Q&A, so I'm gonna trust y'all to, um, to to raise them and, them and we'll, we'll figure out how to answer them. Yeah, uh, I got, okay. we have a few, keep them coming, but this one seems very timely, but what's your best advice for transitioning your team from PLG to enterprise? First of all, admit that you're doing it. Um, you know, I think there's like harsh, there's harsh decisions to make, meaning can the PLG team, and again, I, it's a gross reduction in uh, of the people's skills, but but make sure the people that are that got you here can get you to the next level. That is a hard management lesson, but it, it you you should evaluate that as part of, as part of the process. 
Um, assuming that you have the team that can make the transition, then be dead honest about why. Um, I have been spread too thin over the last year, but one of the things that I really focus on as a marketing leader and challenge anyone to do is really understand the business part of your business, right? Um, so what is, why does cost per acquisition matter? What is lifetime value? What is the cost to acquire? Like all of these things, the more you understand the business, then, and if you bring everyone on the team along the journey, then it's like, why would we keep focusing there or, or only focus on, you know, single seed end user adoption? That's a great model, but look at the opportunity we have in the enterprise and, and like walk people, show the math, show the business um, and be transparent about why and, and what the opportunity is. Um, I think those are the, so those are like, it's one part cultural, one part leadership, just showing this is how, how and how and why I think is huge. Um, Garrett, you've been on both sides of this. Any, anything to add as you, as you reflect? No, I, I think the honesty and upfrontness is key, right? Like this, this has to change a little bit, you know, do it a little bit at a time. Uh, I, I just like, I mean, I've worked with you for a long time, just being honest about stuff. Like this is what's happening and the why will help people understand. Uh, it can be very messy. <laughs> You know, certainly for people or, or, or organizations that have been around in a long time and have a, a very unique culture, uh, just. Uh, you know, sorry, you say that reminding me that like too, it's, it's it, growth is a team sport. Kyle over at OpenView wrote a blog post this year that showed up in my inbox this morning for some reason. And it's like, who owns growth at a PLG company? And if you're asking that question, it's actually, you're already in a tough spot because the answer is everybody. Product does, marketing does, and then sales increasingly does, right? But it's not any one of the three. So it requires a collaborative mindset. And if, if the person that asked the question, if, 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 if you're a leader of that team, you have to lead through that and show that no, 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 like none of us own, we collectively own. And maybe that needs, means we need a biz ops team or we need like this, like we need finance to take a, 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 a you know, a subject or a objective view at the, at the challenge, but, but lead through it and acknowledge that no one knows one single team as much as earlier in my career, I thought it was all marketing owns everything. Like if you want to grow a company you invest in marketing, like I, I was bullish on that. Now I, I, I see that it's a much more nuanced answer of collaboration. Awesome. Can you unshare your screen so they can see our oh, face bigger? Thank you. Yay. Um, a couple on, on sort of converting free to paid and, and how do you avoid the high churn rates from free trials for starter plans? And then uh, it, what are the targets for converting free, free to, to paid? How do we, have you thought about sort of that world and as it's yep. progressed? Um, yeah, and I think, I think this two directions there. One is free trials and the urgency that a trial that has an expiration date provides. So if you're a B2B software player, really understanding how much time to value you need. Um, don't do 14 days because it's what everyone does. Don't do 30 days because it's what everyone used to do. Um, figure out what that time to value is. I think that's super critical um, on the, on the, um, on the trial side, I think the, the what's been a learning curve for me is on the Calendly side is finding, we have a free trial, everyone that creates an account gets access to all the features for 14 days. But on the 15th day, honestly, we don't make that big of a deal about it. We don't use the urgency of the trial period because we want people to adopt the product. So when, when those features that we offered as the trial drop off, <clears throat> We keep telling the customer, hoping you're liking it. If you didn't use those features, keep using it for free for ever, basically. And, and, but that doesn't mean that we're not capitalistic like any other good, good software company. It means that they, they will ultimately, and I mean this, you know, it sounds, sounds like whatever, but like, you know, they will ultimately bump into some of our paywalls. Um, and understanding what those paywalls are, at what point do you expose a feature that, is worth investing in. It is worth taking your credit card out if it's an individual user or a small team. Um, 
<clears throat> we're still, we still experiment on that. The key is like writing the hypotheses down, running the test or surveying users if it's too hard to run it as a test. Um, I think now we have a list of, again, I'll, I'll, I'll make it up, but I think it's more than 10 different paywall opportunities, meaning free user bumps into a, a they want to add another event to their Calendly. And, they, and, we, and so we introduce saying, hey, that's great, but you're past your 14 days. If, if you want to do that, you have to, you have to choose a paid plan. <clears throat> that model has served us very well. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up because I want Garrett to actually talk because he's probably closer to it, but like that, that model led to, um, uh, it, or, or rather still true is that most of our customers convert to revenue um, in the first five or six weeks. So, so we still have a finite amount of time to move a customer from interest to purchase because from there it's diminishing returns because if they didn't see the value, they're not gonna keep investing their time. So, so there's urgency that we create upon ourselves, but we don't force the customer through that urgency hole. Yeah, this one, this one's tough to balance between making, you know, keeping the free, free version useful and, and people wanting to use it, but also making money. And, and the best example was New Relic. We were extremely good. We had transaction tracing. We got you signed up, you, you put it in, and then like, that was what we showed you. And you, that's what you loved. Um, it's also the, the hardest thing that we, that we built. So we, you know, you have to charge for it. And so we very, we very quickly showed them value as value of something they had to pay for, but we also explained it well in our communications. We're like, this is why it's important when you have an issue, we tell you exactly where that, that is and, and identifying those extremely high value, extremely easy to understand and extremely easy to use features that end up costing money. Uh, doing that well in, in, in the however long your free trial is, we on the free trial front, uh, we had the 14 day free trial equip and it was what it was. But but quickly, as we we realized buyers need a little more time, it takes some time to get because it's collaborative. Right. And and it's not like you were like you can do it by yourself. You instantly see re results, a collaborative or, or user based trial takes time to get everybody in and get everybody understanding. And so we then transitioned or gave sales the ability to have an extended trial, like let, let it morph into what it needs to be in order to see the value, right? Just doing something because everybody does it or it's what you want to do. Uh, it's helpful at the beginning and helps you set your, your path, but you have to adjust to what the customers want and or need and, and then tell them exactly their language. That's right. And that transition, that I think that language is exactly the essence of the amazing part of PLG, which is have your hypotheses, but then watch what users are doing and ask them what they're doing and what they need. That user centricity is what makes PLG magical, more so than the business model, more so than anything else. It's, it's understanding your users, making them delight, delighted and happy and psyched um, to use your product. Um, I, I see that it's, it's, time i don't know if we have one more i, I, I probably don't um if sorry, we do we have time caitlin yeah you guys can answer a couple more Go awesome because nice. there's a question from jason so there's a couple so i figured i might as well at least answer one so in a viral platform do you get to count the free acquisition in your cpa or do you get credit for free in or, or what is our, our, our roi and our metrics for a product that has hundreds of thousands of users <laughs> I'm selfishly um, asking this in case. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, that was such a plant question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so the question is like, great. In, in a, when you're wearing your marketing hat and you have you have some amount of dollars to invest, uh, do you, do you, do you get to count the free users, the virality um, in your CAC, met, your cost to acquire metrics, and and lifetime value and all that good stuff? The the short answer is is no. The longer answer is yes. Right, like. And I, th I believe this to be true. We, we have to be able, you have to measure your campaigns with honesty and, and, and that requires you to measure what you can and not take credit for the things that were already coming in. Like you have to start there. I also believe every dollar that you put out into the market has benefit outside of the trackable, you know, did, does the user have a UTM attached to it, right? And so, so you have to be comfortable with investing 
Beyond that, knowing that the, the viral stuff that you in quotes get for free is gonna lift when you're out there telling, telling the story. Now it matters what story you're telling. It, we, Garrett has a job that's very specific, which is to tell the world that Calendly is more than what you know or knew it as. And instead it's something bigger and better. And, and, and it's got these amazing features that you may not know. That story yields much higher value customers, but not a ton more signups. So cost per signup got, will get worse in a sense because we're now targeting the higher value customers that, that want access to those types of things. So um, that's my answer, Garrett. Uh, the plant question is Garrett and I have to, are constantly dealing with this, right? And um, I, maybe just one more internal thing real quick is, is we know now who the buyers that are the most valuable for Calendly. And I had learned from GC, who is Giancarlo, who was at Dropbox during this similar growth phase. And he's like, yeah, we had lots and lots of viral Dropbox users that were sharing music videos and doing all these things, but it was designers. It was designers that were making the platform successful and were willing to pay and were uh, spreading it collaboratively every time that they were sharing a design. And so they only spent money marketing to designers, or at least that's the folklore, um, and it's what he said he did. Um, and so we're doing a similar model where we're only focusing our dollars to where we actually put focus and, and investment in, in places where we know those customers have like literally 10x the value of, of that um, other user. And that doesn't mean that we don't love the other user, it just means that um, from, a, from a return on investment, that's how we look at it. That's fair. And yeah, there's so much behind that. Uh, <laughs> we'll go real quick. We've got probably two minutes left, but how do we mine our, our viral user base for to, to, to find potential sales leads for the, for the mid-market, the enterprise? Um, it, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so uh, first of all, we're not necessarily aces at it yet. Um, uh, not at all. Uh, no offense, Garrett, but the, so the, we translate that into product qualified leads, right? So you have, you have hundreds of thousands of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people signing up um, through the get started with Calendly, you know, the, the 14 day trial of the individual seat. Meanwhile, we have a sales team that, that is thriving and built, making these very large transactions. And, and in a lot of ways, we, until very recently, there were two separate pools, rightfully so. But today, we are busy trying to find those signals, finding the use, uses um, that trigger someone from being, oh, no, they're happy as a self-serve user, short of them raising their hand. Obviously, we, incur we try to get them to join webinars to educate them, and then that off turns into, hey, I'd like to learn more. I'd like to have SAML or SSO or whatever it is that, that, that the customer needs. Um, so that, that's one path and that's the easy path. The, the data version of it, um, the, the two answers and, and um, one is we made hypotheses and bets based on like, all right, if someone's turning on our Salesforce integration, self-serve inside their, their trial, it probably means that they're going to be using it with many seats and have a business use case. And so we'll, we'll take those who activated this feature or that feature will kick them over. Um, some, sometimes that works and sometimes sales starts to ignore them because they don't convert as, as well. So that's one. And then two, I love all of these companies, whether it's Pocus or Endgame and all, all the companies that are, are, are coming up in, in trying to solve this. Um, we'll, we'll absolutely use one of those, I'm sure, in, in our journey this year, but we will also continue to invest in data science because um, I don't think a tool can be as intimate with our users and how they use it to discover that aha moment um, as much. How's that? And it looks like we're at time. It does Ooh. look like we're at time. Wah. We are. So many, so many great insights and also great questions. So Patrick, Garrett, thank you both for walking us through your journey and sharing some of the lessons learned and um, some of the things you do differently. Really enjoy it. We've got a couple more sessions. Um, for the remainder of the day. So be sure to check those out and hope you all are enjoying Saster Scale. Patrick, Eric.